Hello and warmest of Septandi greetings to you and yours. Septandi is that magical time of year when Santa Shack and Radio Claws stuff our stockings with old transistors and tailor tubes. But let us never forget the true meaning of Septandi. It's not really about old electronics, and it's not really even about vintage computing. It's about family. 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 In the spirit of the season, I've been airing a series where I've gone back in time to explore code I wrote in high school in assembly language for a Moon Patrol game, which I never finished. Today is a very special episode because we are looking at the final two parts of that code. Explosions and scorekeeping. Now don't you cry. This isn't the end. There is more to come, and I promise you it will be every bit as exciting as you have been led to understand this series to be. But for now, let's take a look at those last two parts of the code. So let's watch the blow up happen in slow motion. So at this point, the bullet has just entered what was the rectangle of the enemy. And you can see we've started blowing it up here. So there's kind of a center to the blow up. And we do some kind of random colors in this kaleidoscope pattern. So I'm gonna continue with that. And we continue and it sort of expands out, expands out till it encompasses the rectangle and then we enter this phase where from the center we start erasing the debris and luckily everything is just right over green so we can just like erase it all out oh it looks like uh, we just blew up again because the shooting kept happening that would be another bug so I apparently blew up the enemy twice uh, so there we go, and it's erasing it again. Let's see if I can blow it up a third time. Yep. Okay. Guess we'll add that to the list of things that I might or might not fix. Let's talk blow up. So in the main loop, we call EN1XE. And EN1XE is a simple wrapper around enemy one. And enemy one, as we discussed last time, uses this variable e one bulco to tell it if either it was just hit, 126, or if it has been hit a little while ago and is still in the process of blowing up. So let's see how the blowing up actually happened. Near the top of the enemy one subroutine up here, we check out the e one bulco variable. And first we check to see if it's 126, which means we need to start blowing up. In which case, if it is, we'll go to E1 blow start. Otherwise, we take another look at E1 bill co, and we just ask if it's non-zero. And if it's non-zero, then we are still in the process of blowing up, so we'll go to the E1 blow continue routine. So let's start with the start routine. Blow start just calls the blow continue routine. The only difference is that it will seed the blow condition variable with one first. So really all the action happens here. If it's just starting, bilco is one, otherwise we're in the middle of blowing up. An E1 block is really just a wrapper around this here, the blow up routine, which can be repurposed for blowing other things up like the car. The blow up subroutine expects a few things to be set up. So the X register should be pointing to the center of the rectangle that we're gonna blow up. These variables tell you the radius, the horizontal radius and the vertical radius of that rectangle. This is the blow up condition and it's either going to be positive, zero, or negative. So positive, that's going to be the radius of debris that we're up to. So we kind of start with a small radius and then we uh, expand. If it's negative, it's going to be the radius to be erased. That means we're in that second phase where we're erasing the debris. And zero means we're done, I think, or maybe not, I don't remember. 
When we're erasing, we're going to use this to tell us what the background color is so we know what to erase the object with. In this case for the enemy, it's green. And then on exit, you can expect we've done like one new pixel or one new byte of blowing up or erasing. So we start off by checking our conditions. This is the blow up condition and we check to see what it, where it's at. If it's negative, we uh, will have to negate it and we set a flag to tell us that we're erasing. Otherwise, we skip over that when it's positive. And just to give you an idea of what's going on after all this stuff, if you keep on going down, keep on going down, keep on going down, do a bunch of stuff, and then we have this skip over sub subs to main loop. So like in the middle of the code, literally, are sub subroutines of the subroutine. And we have to skip over them just so we can branch subroutine back to them. These subroutines are about getting random numbers to figure out what the colors need to be, calling somehow this random subroutine that I knew about somehow without initializing any floating point accumulators. So I seem to think I'm getting a random byte value here, but how random can it really be? But we don't do that yet. We're going to skip over to blow 61st. Oh my gosh, this is so long. And then blow 60 as necessary is going to branch to that subroutine to erase things or to draw things to create the debris. I'm going to spare you all the details, but let's just take a quick look to see how that kaleidoscope pattern is created. That mainly happens in this loop here. So X and Y are pointing at two horizontal lines that keep separating from each other. So X keeps going up and Y keeps going down. We take B, which is the quote unquote random byte for the colors, and we put that into A's offset into X and A's offset into Y. So this is giving us a vertical symmetry. We store that same color into exactly where X and Y are, and this is supposedly giving us a horizontal symmetry, but that's, that's not quite working out. A is supposedly representing an ever-growing radius of debris, so as A gets bigger and bigger, we're supposedly making these colors go further and further out. But I don't think that's what's happening. But if you look carefully, it doesn't really have all the symmetries that the code seems to think that it's making. Like, sure, we got blue here, blue here, but what is this green here? It's very strange. We got this green and this red. That's not quite symmetric. And then after one frame, a bunch of colors changed here. The radius doesn't seem to be moving very much, but we kind of change everything. And it's like, it's just not quite symmetric. And it takes several iterations of the main, main, main loop before we finally start growing. And if you look here, you know, on the right side, we got the red. Here we got the blue. We've got the vertical symmetry, but then lots of things change, but not everything changes on each main loop iteration. I'm pretty sure this isn't doing what I originally intended, but then I saw what it was doing and I said, oh, well, that's actually not so bad. Meanwhile, B, after we restore it, is keeping track of how many times you want to go through this loop to kind of generate more and more debris on a given iteration of the main, main, main moon patrol loop. We end up drawing and redrawing the same pixels multiple times on a given iteration of the main, main loop. Uh, this slows things down, but it also maybe it makes it look a little interesting. In any case, that's about as far as I want to go with this code. There's really only one other part of the code that I haven't gone over yet in all these videos, and that is the scoring system, which I don't really have wired up to anything. So I just added two lines so that we could see it in action. You call this routine, which I'll show a little later, and it expects that the D register will have the value of the score, and then this will display it at the top of the screen. So to test it, I'm going to set the D register to load the value of the counter. So as you might recall, each time, each iteration through the main loop, I increment a counter, and then the counter can be used to decide when certain things happen, like every third time we rotate the mountains, every single time we rotate the ground, 
and eventually the counter could be used to decide when an enemy would come up or when a hold would come up or something. But for now I'm just going to show the counter as it increments in where the score would normally be. And here we go. One of the things that impressed me when I originally did this was how fast assembly language can just stick these bytes into memory. Um, I figured like I was kind of comparing with in basic when you use the draw command with those strings and you wanted to like write letters or write numbers, it would take a long time. You could never do something like this this fast. So I thought that was pretty cool. And looking at all the rest of the action, it doesn't look like it's slowed down too much. I think it is slowed down somewhat, I think noticeably, but not too much. So how did we do the score? So as I mentioned, the scoring subroutine assumes that the D register has the score that you want to display. Uh, we start by pointing you to the part of memory where the digit is going to show up. And then we call this portion of the routine once for each of the different digits. And so each time we advance you across, and then this is telling us what we're dividing the score by so we can extract that digit. So each time we call SCO10, we do that division. We divide the full score by that X, which tells us which digit we're gonna grab out of it save some registers, and then we call digit. So digit is the subroutine responsible for displaying a single digit onto the screen. And it assumes the U register points to where that's going to go, and the B register will have that digit. The digit subroutine is quite simple, thankfully. So all of the interesting part of it is in this table. So this table has entries of seven bytes. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And each entry corresponds to one possible digit. So this is how you would draw a zero. This is how you would draw a one. This is how you would draw a two. And each byte is shown on a single line. So this is four pixels for the first line. This is four pixels for the second line. This is four pixels for the third line, all the way down to the seventh line. And if you look here, you can kind of imagine that it's that it is indeed four pixels going across and then seven going down. That kind of looks like what it is. It's not the prettiest font, but it gets the job done. So it can multiply that seven by the digit to figure out what entry we're going to start at. So if the digit were zero, we would start here. If the digit were one, we would start here and so on. And then we load X with the beginning of the table. We add B, which is that product to X. So now X is pointing at the correct entry. And then we load A with seven again. So that's sort of our loop countdown. So this loop just goes through the seven bytes in that entry that we found, and it writes them to the screen wherever U is. So each time through the loop, we increment X by one, so we can look at the next byte we're gonna draw, and we increment U by 32, so that we could go, can go down to the next line. Each time through, we decrement our counter, so we know when we're done, and then we're done. That's the whole thing. Well, that covers all of the code that I found and read and understand. Um, so in the next episode, we're not going to be looking at old code so much as different changes that I can make, different improvements that I can make, uh, given the knowledge I now have that I didn't have back then. So I will see you then.